And happy Valentine's Day to all you out there that um, I love and God loves. And I hope you enjoyed that time of worship. It was just so uh, powerful and meaningful um, like it is every week. Our privilege to worship him. And uh, you know what? Being Valentine's Day, do yourself a favor and text someone today. Call someone. Tell them you love them. Doesn't really matter if Valentine's Day is your thing or not because what if it's their thing? What if they like it? Then uh, it's not about you anyway. It's about them. So uh, just go ahead and do that. Texting, you know, it works. It's simple. It's easy. It's like the very least we can do, right? Uh, it's the best. Texting is also the worst, right? Because if you've ever texted um, and been misunderstood, you know how terrible that could be. Texting without using emojis is like talking under a mask, right? No one can see your facial expressions. Uh, voice fluctuations are muffled, thereby interpretation of intention is skewed. <laughs> uh, when you text and you use a period, it seems strong, right? An exclamation point could be forceful. All caps literally hurts my ears. I'm like, what? if my kids ever do that, I'm like, why are you doing that? You know, uh, I think we can all agree on that. Emojis, though, emojis are where it's at. And there's a, they're always coming out with new ones, which is great. And they soften and they lighten and they actually help communicate the emotion behind the comment. For example, someone asks, how are you? If you respond, I'm good, period, it's like, but are you really? Right? We think that. But if you say, I'm good, big, happy, smiley face, then you're really good. If you use a happy, smiley face and an exclamation point and some praise hands, I mean, we know you are really, really good. So just, you know, use emojis. Um, let's just all agree, though, to give grace in our texting right, in uh, receiving and giving um, taxes, and to commit to learning each other's texting dialect, because I feel like everyone's a little different, and uh, we can all learn something there. Anyway, that being said, um, in the book of Philippians, I feel like in chapter 3, starting at verse 12, Paul wished he, he, had, he knew about that, um, about the emojis, or maybe that he had access to emojis at that time. I mean, he could have drew, drew them out maybe. But here it is. He starts at verse 12, and it's, it's like he's trying to convey something um, difficult to convey in writing. So in his letter to the Philippians, he's, he's trying to accomplish something, but it's difficult because it's in writing and it, it's not in person, and in person it's easier. Let's read, starting at verse 12. Most of what I'm going to read today is going to be from the message version, but I will throw in a few others. This is in the message. He says, I'm not saying I have it all together, that I have it made, but I'm, I'm well on my way reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Then he's like, friends, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong here. Um, I said I was reaching out to Christ, you know, but, but no means do I count myself an expert. So don't misinterpret what I'm saying here in all of this. But on the other hand, I do have my eye on the goal, he says, where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. It's like, <laughs> he's like, geez, if I say it this way, they may interpret it that way. If I say it that way, they may interpret it this way. He's covering all the bases. Don't get me wrong. I'm doing good. I am reaching for Christ. I'm doing all I can, but I'm not perfect. Don't think I'm perfect. I hope I'm not coming across perfect. He's like over communicating here. That being said, over communicating is where it's at. I'd rather over communicate than under communicate. Paul is communicating to the Philippians the importance of continuing to grow in the Lord. He, he doesn't want them to get the wrong idea, the wrong intent in his writings. He's, he's not there to show them in person. So he's trying to give them this well-rounded view on paper that even as a seasoned leader, he's still working on himself. And he really does have a solid, honest view of his current status. Mueller said it like this. He said, just as a little child is a perfect human being, 
but still is far from perfect in all his development as a man. So the true child of God is also perfect in all its parts, although yet not perfect in all the stages of his development in faith. Because it's Paul, people may have felt, well, like he's literally been through it all. And he looks like he has it all together. I mean, look at his position and his title. Look at his history. I mean, he's in prison now for his faith. Look at, look at what he's been given, though. Paul is saying, hey, I just want you to keep me on the level here. And he's keeping himself grounded. I want to be clear, maybe a little over clear. I'm not perfect, but I am moving forward in the Lord. See, many, many leaders don't do this. They, they can hide behind masks of perfectionism. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm good. My kids are good. We're good. We're thriving. Everything's great. It, I mean, sometimes, but not all the time. <laughs> if that's the answer all the time, you might want to run really far from that person because I don't, I don't know if there's honest assessment there. I mean, sometimes that's my answer. And sometimes my answer is like, it's not good. <laughs> I think sometimes people think they're better than they are, and sometimes people think they're worse than what they are. But neither is right. One is pride and one is insecurity. Both are wrong, and both is not who you are in Christ. Paul says, I want to continue to run. I, want, I will run that I may reach out and lay a hold of that for which Jesus has reached out and laid a hold of for me. To reach out and lay a hold, in some translations it talks about that laying hold, is taken from the word apprehend. The word apprehend is the same Greek word translated attained, but with a different take. It literally means to be taken and forced down. He wants to catch a hold of it and pull it down in order to have it in his grip. This is Paul. Paul is focused on living out his Jesus story. He knew, he knew Jesus laid a hold of him for a reason. His dramatic life-changing moment, Jesus captures him and captivates him, transforms him. But there was a reason for that. Why? Why did Jesus capture Paul? Jesus captured Paul for transformation, for confirmation, for declaration, for reformation, for association, and for transportation. Well, what do you mean by that? Jesus laid a hold of Paul to make him a new man. Transformation. So that he could lay a hold of that in order to do the transforming work of Jesus. Jesus laid a hold of Paul to conform him into the image of Jesus so that Paul could lay a hold of that same power to, in order to see that nature within himself. Jesus laid a hold of Paul to make him a witness, to declare the witness of Jesus to the world. Jesus laid a hold of Paul to make him an instrument of reformation so that Paul could go out and be a reformer. Jesus laid a hold of Paul to make him an instrument of conversion for others. He laid a hold of Paul to bring him into suffering so that he would know the sufferings of Jesus, so that he would know what it's like to die, to be a laid down lover of the one that took a hold of him. Jesus laid a hold of Paul so that he would live forever, to be transported, to be associated here on earth in his sufferings, and then transported into heaven one day to have that hope of eternity. In verse 13, again, in a more familiar version, it says that he forgot what was behind and strain towards what was ahead. Forgetting what is behind, Paul says, straining towards what is ahead. He said, I don't focus on what I wasn't, where I'm not, where I missed it, mistakes I've made. I forget about it. But I lean into, I strain towards what is ahead. I press on, verse 14. I push myself. 
Paul pressed on for what Jesus wanted. His effort was about doing God's will, not his own. In the workout program, I think I talked about this last time I spoke, or at least I mentioned a workout program, but there's one we're doing right now, uh, Craig and I, and we are in our eighth week, which is the last week, and man, it's like fast. It went by fast, and it's a lot of lifting. It's called Lift 4, and there are shoulder presses. Shoulder presses take a lot of force, take a lot of effort and strength. In fact, the trainer says, use your heaviest weights. I was saying, use your heaviest weights. You can do better than that. You can lift more than that. I'm like, I don't know. It's like pretty heavy. Like my arms aren't that big. He's like, you can do more. Lift heavy weights. To lift heavy weights, to do these shoulder presses, to press in, it takes precision. It takes form. Why? Because they're heavy. Beyond what's easy to bear. See, you can do the program two ways. I, I can do it two ways. I can listen to the trainer. I can increase weight. I can follow form. I can challenge myself. Or I can do what's manageable. He's, I mean, he's not in my living room. Like, he doesn't really know what I'm doing. You can be a Christian two ways. You can listen to the trainer. In this case, it's Paul who we're reading about, who is continually encouraging us to forget what's behind you and move into, to press into what's ahead. Or you can do what you always have. You can manage your fears, your struggles, your history. See, your history will keep you in prison. Your destiny will hinge on your push. If you want to gain strength, If I want to move forward in progress, I have to bear weight. I have to increase the weight. I have to lean, and I have to strain. This ain't easy street. Uh, Friends of mine were moving. uh, They were uh, from somewhere out uh, Midwest, and they were moving to California many, many years ago to pastor. And they had friends of theirs that already had moved from the state that they were currently living in to California. So they called up their friends and said, hey, guess what? We're moving to California too. We got a church. We're excited. We're going to do this. And they're like, listen, guys, you may not believe me, but California is just not what I thought it was going to be. And they're like, what do you mean? California is awesome. California is the best place to live. We see it on TV all the time. It is hot. It is beautiful. There's like, it's, it's amazing. They're like, no, no, not where we are. It's, there's no beaches. We're really far from anything beautiful. It's, it's different than what we anticipated. And then the friends of ours were like, oh, Not all California is created equal. I hear what you're saying. And they're like, well, we're moving to San Diego, so it's fine. We're good. And they were right. It's good. California, San Diego is the best. Anyway, not all California is created equal. I'm sure you can agree with me on that. There are some not as great places as others. And then there is a lot of great places. Well, not all Christians are created equal. You're like, whoa, that is blasphemous. God creates us all equal. Yes, that's not what I mean. What I mean is... Not all Christians are the same. Not all Christians live for Jesus well. Be careful who you're looking after. Be careful who you're following in example. They may look the part. They may act a little bit the part, but they aren't living it well. And this is what Paul is talking about. He's saying, don't do that, though. Be better than that. Press on. Don't give up. Don't look back. God's intention was always for us to move forward and to look forward or he would have put the eyes in the back of our heads. Verse 15, let's keep going. It says, so let's keep focused on the goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us. If any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear that blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now we're on the right track. Let's stay on it. See, you know what you know. And what you know you're responsible for. And what you don't, I feel like it's time to learn. There's no excuses in not living out what you do know because of what you don't know. Live at your level of revelation. 
Verse 17, stick with me, friends. He says, keep track of those you see running the same course, headed for the same goal, the like-minded believers. There are many out there taking other paths, choosing other goals, trying to get you to go along with them. And I've warned you about this many times, and sadly, I'm having to do it again. All they want is easy street. They hate Christ's cross. But easy street is a dead end street. Those who live there make their bellies their God. Belches are their praise. And all they can think of is their appetites. Paul is sad here. He, is, he, he says in another translation, with weeping, he's noticed these things. This situation, this issue is affecting Paul's emotional state. The enemies of the cross Paul's referring to were the opposite of the legalistic Christians. See, many times it was the religious people that caused problems. But here, he's not talking about the religious people. He's talking about the people who celebrate their freedom in Christ way too much. To the extreme indulgence of the flesh. They're like super free people. (laughs) It was the unrighteous, unholy Christian life that we literally see everywhere. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. Paul was dealing with people who acted like their salvation ca- came without true repentance and conversion. And who, who lived as though, as long as, as long as my soul is saved, it doesn't really matter what I do with my body. I can, I can live the way I want to live because God is love and there's always grace. Being an enemy of the cross didn't mean that they were literal enemies of the physical cross. It meant they were enemies of the biblical truth of the atonement that Jesus made for us on the cross and its ongoing power that should be active in our lives. They were enemies because they didn't actually want to follow Jesus. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. They're saying, I'm not picking up that cross. In their disregard for God's holiness and in living such a way to represent him, they actually give ammunition to the legalistic accusation that Paul was preaching a cheap grace that required no commitment of a life. This grieved Paul. This is why he was sad. This is why he was weeping. And it simply was not true. How many of you are tired of half-baked Christians giving the rest of the Christians a bad rap? I'm tired of it. It's simply not true. Deception, lives, manipulation, secrets, conflicts, freedoms. That's not Jesus. Paul wept for what he watched. Charles Spurgeon says, I never read that the apostle Paul wept when he was persecuted. Although they plowed his back with furrows. I do believe that never a tear was seen to gush from his eye while soldiers scorched him. Though he was cast into prison, we read of his singing, never of his groaning. I do not believe he ever wept on any account of sufferings or dangers to which he himself was exposed for Christ's sake. I call this extraordinary sorrow because the man who wept was of no soft piece of sentiment and seldom shed a tear even under grievous trials. Paul went through so much. On the, for the sake of Christ and living out his Jesus story and never complained and never wept. But this grieved his heart. It wasn't the suffering for Jesus that was hard. That was easy. It was the Christians, misleading Christians, the fighting, the dissension, the confusion, the freedoms. Spurgeon also says this, he says, professors of religion who get into the church and let lead ungodly lives are the worst enemies of Christ's cross. These are the sort of men who bring tears into the minister's eyes. 
These are they who break his heart. These are they who are the enemies of Christ's cross. Belches are their praise. Another version says, those whose glory is in their shame. These so-called Christian lives were a reflection of living for what temporary satisfied, for what was embarrassing, they were actually proud of, and they were obsessed with their cravings. They were hyped about the things they should have been ashamed of. We see it all the time. We see the posts on social media. We see the indulges, the activities those, of those who, who live by Christ's name. But, but the, the rest of the Christian family looks and, and stands back and, and is in awe that someone who supposedly lives for Jesus could do all these anti-Jesus things. He would never. How do you know, Renee? How, how do you know Jesus wouldn't do that? It's actually not that hard. I just read about him in here, and I don't see it. Paul is grieved, and we should be too. This, this, is, this is a tough word, but like I, I don't actually care because, because the Bible is offensive. It's offensive. So when I preach it, when people preach the word of God, we will be offensive too. But we believe it, so we're not going to silence it. But there is good news. There is good news. <laughs> Verse 20, let's go. We, see, we don't have to live this way. There's a better option. Verse 20, there's far more, Paul says, to life for us than, than that which I'm warning you about. He says, we are citizens of a high heaven. We are awaiting the arrival of the Savior, the Master, Jesus Christ, who will transform our earthly bodies into glorious bodies like his own. He makes us beautiful and whole with the same powerful skill by which he is putting everything in this life as it should be under and around him. Come on. How many need him at work in your life today to make everything as it should be? See, the life we live on earth is, is, is not the finality. There's, it's so much more temporal than we give it credit for. We live here, but we're citizens of there. And, but often we act as if this is all there is, and this is all that we ever will be, and it's really not true. There's more. Eternity is real. Heaven is real. We will live there forever. But for now, a very, very short now, we live our destiny here on earth as ambassadors of our homeland, heaven. We represent Jesus and we live our story out well because we owe him that. It's the very least we can do. Is there anything more exciting than a visitor from home? If you are... Um, from somewhere other than where you currently live, then you know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? There's something special about when a visitor comes from home that you haven't seen in a while. Uh, when they show up, there's like this familiarity. There's like a, a reminiscing. There's this, there's this natural understanding of things native to your homeland or your upbringing. And they bring you stuff highlight moments. Uh, my mom is notorious for this. And um, you know how like you can just take a carry on on most flights and then you have to pay for the one that goes under. Well, she, she will take her carry on for her personal belongings, like her clothes and her toiletries and all those things that you need when you're on a vacation. But the big suitcase that she pays to go under the plane, oh, she fills with stuff. <laughs> stuff from Canada for us. And it's food mostly all of it is food and and uh there was one time that she came in particular and uh was just a couple years ago and she has this suitcase and it is like I mean it is packed in there and the zipper is kind of stretching a little bit and she opens it up and as she does that thing literally explodes across the living room I mean there were like candy bars and chips and treats flying everywhere we were like Oh, my gosh. I mean, she is too much. I mean, in, in the most 
amazing way. She is too much. And we get things like coffee crisps. Um, when this was on a commercial, like way back in the day, the commercial was really funny. It would, it would be one person would be like, hey, how do you like your coffee? It's like, oh, I like my coffee crisp. You like your coffee crisp? I like my coffee crisp. That was it. And then there's this other one, Big Turk. This is like, if you've ever watched the um, movie Narnia, and they talk about Turkish delight, well, this is, you know, Canadian version of Turkish delight. And uh, it is awesome. And if any of you uh, want these, I would be happy to share with you. If you've never had them, yeah, you can have them. Yeah, just consider it. Have you on Valentine's Day for me to you. So there's that. But, um, yeah, they bring you stuff, and it's exciting. And, and Paul is like, he's saying here, I'm just here waiting for Jesus to come from my homeland because that's where I'm from, and when he comes, he's going to bring me stuff. He's going to bring me the best gift ever. It's called transformation. It's called transportation to heaven. And I've been pressing on, and I will continue to press on, and I've been straining, and I've been pushing, and I've been doing my best. But there is a visitation coming to me, coming to you. It is a moment where all things become new. It is a moment where all things will once again make sense. And it is why I am living and is why I'm willing to die. It's why I'm in prison, he's saying. And it's the reason I'm writing to you today. I will be beautiful one day. I will be whole one day. I will be full. I will make a difference today as I'm waiting for that arrival. Wow. What a future. What a future to look forward to as we lean into our Jesus story. See, I don't think we think about heaven as much as we should. Some people say, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. I say, the more heavenly minded, the more earthly good. Heaven's mind, being so in love with earth, sent one of its own to live, to die in order for that one, one day, to bring redemption to the earth and restore it back to heaven. Come on. It's the glorious hope. Jesus captured you. He captured me for our stories to be lived and for you to be used by him. You've been captured just like Paul for transformation, for confirmation, for de declaration of his goodness, for reformation of the world, for association in his sufferings, and one day a glorious transportation to eternity. The challenge today is simple. Simplicity is key. Simplicity. Key. The challenge is Every morning when you wake up, and maybe throughout the day, you say, Jesus, what should I do today? And then do just that. You're like, what's my Jesus story? How do I live out my destiny? I don't know if I have fulfillment or purpose or anything in my life. Jesus, what do I do today? Okay, I'll do just that. To end, chapter 4, verse 1, he says, my dear, dear friends, I love you so much. I do want the very best for you. You make me feel such joy. You fill me with such pride. So don't waver. Stay on track. Steady in God. Paul loved his people. And I love you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you that uh, there's a day called Valentine's Day that I know it's just like any other day, but it's a day that we can overemphasize, overcommunicate our love for people and for you. I pray that today that people, myself included, would be challenged to just live out my story better to not waver, to not be taken to a different direction because I see other people who say they live for you, but they don't do the things that you would do. 
that I wouldn't waver into that, but I would stay my eyes fixed on you, that I would stay focused and live out well my ambassador duties here on earth that others could see and follow. We just love you, and we want nothing more than to live for you. Bless your people today in your name.